So I went to high school in a really rural place, and I didn't know that being an artist was still a thing <laughs> when I was in high school. It was sort of um, on a list with like blacksmiths and cobblers, like people used to do that. <laughs> I was born in a very rural part of the country. These agricultural landscapes and the machinery and the equipment that goes with that it was an early influence in the work and I think still kind of permeates the work. So this piece called the Ialu is probably from about 10 years ago, from this body of work kind of looking at fields. The visual of the motion of tall, tall grass in the wind. You never see the wind, you always see the effects of the wind. But also for me, a sort of calling a mind to mind of the front end of a harvester or a reaper and the way that this like, machine enters a field and sort of like cuts the grain down and processes the grain. I don't think of it as a robot creating art. These are no more robots than just sort of like atoms that are moving through space right now. This is just a sort of device that helps visualize or record that phenomenon. So it appears inorganic, but it's actually quite organic. But the heart of it really is controlled chance that you create a barrier and it makes some selections in terms of color. Some of my favorite moments are like in the corner. This is like the highway roadmap business of LA. The overlay in a lot of cases comes out of more historical narratives. A lot of the philosophical questions that are embedded in the work for me are ancient questions. Uh, where do you go when you die? Or what is the wind or where does the wind come from? I'm also very interested in getting out of my routine and seeing the world. Remarkable things can be found all over the place, uh, sometimes just up the road from where you live. It's a question of deviating from your normal path. We are on our way to the Museum of Appalachia, which is a collection of historic artifacts from the region that go back really to early settlers in the area. What's really exciting to me is that a lot of these are utilitarian things, but there end up being these aesthetic qualities to objects that are not always intentional. But as an artist, it's very inspirational. As a sculptural object, this is amazing. And it's so intriguing to be able to come and see the, the tool marks still on here, the way that this was shaped. Man, I would take this thing home and hang it on my wall. These millstones are amazing. There was a moment in time when you saw how things worked and you saw how they were made and even saw who made them. And that's not really a part of society anymore. It's just amazing that there are all of these gears and all of these chains and weights to make two hands on a clock go around. The work is engineering without being an engineer, <laughs> but a lot of it is very much kind of trial and error or discovery. So this is a prototype for a section of a much larger piece with these gears driven by a large central gear. This is a piece called Grist, based off of the same lantern gears that were in the mechanism of the mill. So it's a, a piece that eats itself over time with a, an overlay of this more conceptual question for me about time or timeliness. Influences of a lot of the works are 17th, 18th, 19th century implements historical technology that fed contemporary technology. All of the woodwork is done by hand here in the studio and I guess the obvious gap in that would be the found objects. This is the same model of typewriter that my grandparents had when I was young. Ah, it's already on. 
This was a commission piece. So it's typing the sentence, I will not talk in class. As I was looking at it, the coronet is the model of typewriter, but a coronet is also a musical instrument. Turned it on for the first time and it, there was also all this sound that was coming out of the very imperfect mechanism that I had built. That's not to be done away with and solved, it's to be em embraced and sort of grown as part of the content of the work. Sound is really essential for these pieces. You know, a lot of times the sound is not necessarily a really pleasant tone. The idea that the unpleasant thing and the pleasant thing are originating from the same mechanism kind of mirrors like the idea of life and death not being opposite things, but sort of two sides of the same thing. So I'm supported in part by my teaching appointment and supplemented significantly by the work that I'm able to sell out of the studio on my own. I think at the end of the day, it's too much work to do unless you love it. And so part of it, I think this is something that connects all creative people, but there's a certain compulsion. Like I can't not make the things. And for the most part, I'm making the work that I want to see in the world. And there's a hope that making that work leads to opportunities for conversation. Mm -hmm.